Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And um, I see we have uh, all kinds of questions here. Uh, let's see, where should we start? Um, there's one from Aaron here. Why were only a few species domesticated? Could any species be domesticated? Are humans domesticated? Uh, interesting. So, you know, I think that what does it mean to be domesticated? It means the 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 critters are doing things that people sort of want them to do, and they are uh, kind of operating in some constrained environment. They're living in a house. They're, you know, operating as, um, uh, as, as things you can ride. They're doing this or that thing that is sort of set up for, to be useful for human purposes. It's kind of like the animal version of technology. In technology, you're taking raw material in the physical world and you're setting it up to be useful to humans or in, in sort of physical technology, that's what you're doing. And I, I think the, the case with you know, animals, can you take a lizard and make it useful for human purposes? Or is a lizard just going to do a lizard thing, which isn't really what humans want it to do? Now, it's worth realizing that, that it could be the case that the, you know, it's sort of a two-way thing. Because you know, let's say you want the mouse is going to go around the mouse wheel, and it's going to do that for its mouse reasons, so to speak. And if that's useful to us as humans, great. One might imagine, you know, is there something that a snake might do naturally? I mean, there might be things you can extract from a snake or something, uh, you know, it's, uh, or from the, the body of a snake or whatever. But, um, you know, are there things that a snake might do that might be sort of useful to a human? I suppose one could imagine some some terrible thing where, you know, there are snake warriors where you send them off to go, you know, bite the right person or the wrong person or, or whatever. Um, and and that then one might think of that as sort of a domesticated snake because it's doing something that we sort of, somebody wants it to do. So I think the, the, the question is, when can you get critters to do things that we humans want them to do? And those may be things like, uh, um, and, and, um, and when not. Now, I suppose... You know, when you keep animals in a zoo, for example, you're simply by physical constraints sort of getting the animal to be in a place which is useful for, you know, coming to visit the animal or whatever. Um, and uh, that's a little different from the domesticated case where the animal just decides, oh, I'm going to do this, sort of seems to intrinsically, with its own free will, decide, yes, I'm going to be a horse that... Um, takes the rider to go over a, a you know a bunch of jumps or something like this so the question is when when can that work when can it not work and my impression is that a lot of things where you know, there's a whole sort of process of of learning how to train certain kinds of animals that's been figured out for some kinds of animals it's not been figured out for others is it abjectly impossible for the others or is it just we haven't figured out how to do it i'm i'm not completely sure um, I think that one can imagine some very strange sort of uh, things where, you know, in very small animals like insects, one knows how to kind of instrument the insect brain and put actual sort of electrodes in the right places in the brain to get the insect to do different kinds of things. That's, that's something that gets progressively more difficult with uh, animals with bigger brains and more complicated setups and so on. But one could imagine, you know, what's the uh, th this question of, you know, can you train the animal from the outside to have the, the sort of the intent to do the right thing and, and take the rider over the, over the horse jumps or whatever else? Or, you know, do you end up with a situation where, you know, in the brain of the horse or something, you've, uh, there's electrodes that make it think that uh, this is a good thing to do, so to speak? So I think that's a, you know, this, and this gets very sort of philosophical because it's kind of like, if we imagine that we, as a matter of our own free will, want to do this, this, and this, and then somebody, somehow we have some electrode in our brain that is making us want to do these things, at what point 
do we really internally want to do it? Or is it the outside control that's making us want to do it? Remembering that there are plenty of things that we want to do as a result of external things, like we get hungry and we want to do this. And that's something which is not, you know, hunger is, well, it is ultimately a brain function, but it's a little bit, you know, that, that may be a bad example because I, I think the brain directly senses things like glucose levels. Um, and so in a sense, that's directly happening in the brain, but it's not happening at the kind of thinking level of the brain. It's happening more at the pure sensory input level of the brain. Um, and it, maybe maybe that's no different than if you see a particular thing, you know, you see the giant ad for the, the whatever it is, the, the, the cookie or something, and then you say, I want a cookie. Um, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the same type of thing. But I, I guess that the question of, you know, how do you successfully domesticate some, some kind of critter? I, I think that the real issue is, is there an alignment between the thing that you human want the critter to do and sort of the thing it naturally does? That is, there are creatures that really want to be kind of lone creatures that just go off and do their thing. There are creatures that want to be in packs. And maybe if the creatures want to be in packs, we can kind of insert ourselves as a pseudo pack member, so to speak. And it's like, hey, you know, normally you'd be hunting, you know, you'd be um, uh, sort of hunting in a pack, but um, actually, you know, there's a human handler who's going to give you the same, uh, close enough to the same kinds of signals that um, you will sort of follow the human as you would follow the rest of the pack. And I think uh, my, my guess is that in most cases, one can sort of trace this kind of um, training, so to speak, to uh, to some kind of hack on what the animal is normally doing. You know, I don't know. There are famous examples of I don't know ducks following uh, what is it, baby ducklings and ducklings following ducks and things. And what are they actually following? And I think it's the orange beak is the critical thing or something. And uh, so you know, you just have an orange piece of paper and it'll, they'll, they'll follow that too. And the question is, how do you sort of get the, how do you take the natural behavioral characteristics of animals and sort of hack those enough to get them to do what you want? Now, in a sense, the, the question asked, are humans domesticated? You know, I think that is a funny thing because the fact is that, that we all learn, you know, in, in very early life, we all learn sort of the, the nature of the environment that we happen to be in. And certain kinds of things, uh, certain kinds of things seem to have to be actively taught. Some things we naturally learn. I don't know whether, I mean, I think uh, like learning to walk or something like this. Uh, my guess is that that there isn't, uh, you know, people will certainly try and actively teach kids to walk and so on. But my guess is that that's not strictly necessary. That um, that that would sort of happen naturally. Maybe you have to see examples of other people walking. I'm not sure, but. Um, uh, the, you know, I think that the the question of how um, how we humans get quotes domesticated, um, you know, I, 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 it's certainly the case in in very early life that if you are living out in the jungle, so to speak, versus you're living in some, you know, living in an apartment in the city or something, uh, you'll end up with you know different characteristics really quite early in life and. And later on, you might be able to learn the sort of the crossover between those things, but there will be sort of a natural uh, kind of imprinting of, of some something pretty early on, depending on what environment you're in. And I, I think that that, uh, in a sense, in a sense, the the role of kind of education is can be seen perhaps um, a little bit cynically as some form of domestication, so to speak, I, in, in, in the following sense that, you know, some part of education is kind of letting people, teaching people how to operate in some society or culture that's been set up in a certain way. And that's in a sense, domestication to that kind of society or culture. And uh, uh, people sort of left to their own devices and not sort of educated to know common things with everybody else, who's to say what, what they would do. Now, you know, I, I personally tend to think that sometimes education goes rather overboard in, you know, we all end up having certain ways of thinking for ourselves. And uh, if you domesticate too much, the humans, so to speak, 
you end up that they all just think the same way or don't think very much at all for themselves. And that seems like a bad thing to me. Although it's, it's clear from the point of view of the whole of society that if everybody was thinking about all kinds of different things all the time and nobody was doing anything coherently with anybody else, that that would not lead to a coherent society, so to speak. So, you know, it's clear that, 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 that that's something that we as humans have achieved is this notion of sort of a coherent society. And that does seem to require some amount of sort of common education, so to speak. So anyway, a, a, a strange answer to this question about domestication. I, I don't really know. You know, as I say, I think that the, the way you can tell whether a species is likely to, to be domesticatable is what is its natural way of behaving, and then how does that map into the ways of behaving that we humans want to get out of that species, so to speak. And I suppose it's the case, and maybe there's good examples of this, I don't immediately think of one, where in the course of human history, we humans have wanted different kinds of things. I mean, I suppose uh, at various times, yeah, when, when agriculture was starting up and uh, people needed oxen to you know, pull plows and things like this, I'm not sure that they had been needed for anything, for any, there wasn't necessarily a human purpose for those animals um, before that piece of sort of technology, that piece of, of cultural development had happened. And I suppose, uh, uh, you know, there may be things, you know, if, if we learn better how to communicate with animals, maybe there will be a whole other, uh, you know, raft of kind of domestication, so to speak, of animals. Maybe it will be the case that, you know, instead of having the, um, um, you know, the watchdog or something, you'll have the, um, you know, it will turn out that raccoons are really good at being, uh, you know, at hanging out and being able to tell you the next morning, you know, what happened at night in this area, so to speak. And that might be a, a useful way to use those creatures, which one could only do if one could communicate with them and say, hey, you know, give us the report of what happened. Um, it's, uh, you know, in raccoonese or whatever, that one that would then translate into something that would be understandable to humans. We don't know how to do that yet. Um, and uh, it, it remains, I've talked about this a whole bunch because I find it a really interesting question. It's sort of the communication with alien intelligence. You know, what is the view of the world by a raccoon? And is it translatable into the view of the world by a human? You know, in, in the case of humans, we do okay, maybe not perfectly, at translating between sort of different kinds of human cultures and environments, but we haven't uh, gotten very far except for sort of general emotional states in communicating with most kinds of animals. Anyway, a few thoughts on that. Um, let's see, O'Brien is commenting, does conditioning have to, anything to do with domestication? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, in, you know, the kind of Pavlovian idea, so, so you know, this, this notion of um, Ivan Pavlov, I think, um, the uh, when was it late 1800s I believe um, did this experiment where you know ring a bell feed the dog and pretty soon the um, you ring the bell and the dog will start salivating thinking it's going to get food even though the food is not yet in evidence and that's kind of a a conditioning of uh, kind of teaching the dog something but I, I tend to think that conditioning only goes so far. I might be wrong, but but you know, if you if you do something where you put this whole harness on some kind of creature, I don't know what a a um, uh, what can I say? I mean, you know, you try and condition a um, a finch to talk like a parrot. It's just not going to work because it doesn't have the right syrinx structure or whatever it is to. To talk like that. Similarly, I, I think that um, there are behavioral characteristics of animals that are so sort of deeply burnt in, I doubt you can condition them away. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, that's a question for humans is, you know, can we learn anything? And I think the answer is, there are limits to what we can learn. So for instance, uh, one of the questions when you have a a thing like a helicopter or something, and you're trying to fly it and it's got certain controls. You know, we humans are capable of controlling helicopters. When people tried experiments with, with what we, we now call drones, you know, quadcopters and things like that, 
back a long time ago, they were not controllable by humans. Now, clearly, if you have enough automated assistance and you've got a flight controller that's doing most of the work, well, then they're controllable by humans. But the question is raw, just like you know, if we humans, if you strapped onto us humans eight legs and you said, control these in this and that way, there's probably a point at which we just can't do it. We just don't have the perhaps hardware or other capabilities to be able to do it. Another example in language, you know, there's always a question, what language is understandable? You know, somebody can talk in very long sentences, they can write these giant sentences. You know, what, what features of language can we learn and what can we not? You know, it tends to be the case that if you look at language that people actually use, there's, for example, a limit on the number of subclauses. So you say, the cat which uh, chased the mouse, which ate the cheese, which did the this, which did the that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, if you were to think about kind of the, the parse structure of that sentence, it would be, that would be a noun phrase for, I think, yes, the cat, the, it's, a, it's a qualifier of the, of the cat. And if you drew sort of the tree that represents that, that piece of grammar, it would go deeper, deeper, deeper down the tree, sub, 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 sub clauses. We humans lose it after about five, uh, about depth five. Now, can you, could you train yourself to go deeper? Maybe, maybe there's a way of chunking it so that you can uh, sort of take into your memory and sort of compress into one chunk the thing that you heard first and so on. Maybe not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what limits there are on sort of what's learnable. Another example that I've been exposed to quite a bit is graphs and networks where you have kind of a, you know, you've got a bunch of nodes that represent, I don't know, sort of people, and then you're joining them by, by lines to represent who's friends with who, and or you try and use that to represent sort of the flow of data in a program or something like this, and you'll end up with these very complicated graphs. And the question is, when can humans think in terms of those graphs? For me, that's been important in recent times because our physics project is deeply based on graphs and hypergraphs and so on. And so we're routinely generating these huge graphs. And it's like, when can we humans understand what's going on? And we get sort of an assist by having, by laying out these graphs. If the graphs have certain regularities, we lay them out so they sort of remind us of something which is like a smooth surface or something like this. And then we're kind of off and running. But if we have uh, you know, a graph in the raw, I think it's pretty hard for humans to understand. And I've been interested in this because in doing computational language design, sort of the big question is, you're trying to make a language which humans can actually understand. Because the whole point of a computational language is to bridge between what's in our human minds and what computers can do. And there's much more that computers can do that is not stuff that we understand in our minds. In fact, even by that statement, I'm making the claim that there are things we wouldn't really be able to condition ourselves to do. You know, it's it's um, like I think in the in the Dune universe, for example, where they you know outlaw AIs, they have this notion of, um, of of humans who can do computation, and where they've sort of taught themselves, they've pumped themselves up to to the point where they can sort of compute things that normally just a computer for us, just an electronic computer, can do. So. I mean, there's this question, could you get, yeah, actually, this is a good example of, of conditioning you couldn't achieve, I think. Could you get a person, you know, you, you say, uh, you, you give them all kinds of conditioning, you give them candy if they get it right, you do, you do something terrible if they get it wrong, whatever. Um, can you teach them to multiply six-digit numbers instantly? The answer will be no, I think. You know, whatever you do, However motivated the person is, most people won't be able to do it. It just isn't consistent with human brain hardware and so on. So again, I think that uh, when it comes to these behavioral characteristics, like can you get, I mean, I, I think there's a fine line between what's uh, a question of um, what you choose to do versus what you're capable of doing. You know, the ducks walking in line, the ducklings walking in line, so to speak. I don't know whether uh, the, the, the things where it, they might just not be able to do it, or they might say, I don't want to do that type thing. I'm not sure that there's, you know, I'm not sure how how far apart those things are. Anyway, a few, a few thoughts on that. Um, 
let's see. Uh, okay, this on, on the subject of this this topic, and then we'll go to other topics here. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, www says. Since an octopus has nine brains, each in one leg, how does it see the world? Well, you know, this question about multiple brains, you know, we have these ganglia, which are little sort of uh, uh, collections of nerve cells. You know, we have those in, in, I think, in the reflex arcs in our spinal cord and things like that. There are, there are things where you'll have something, you know, you touch something hot, and you pull your hand away, I, I, if I remember correctly, that doesn't have to go all the way to your brain for that to start happening. There are things in before the, the nerves have gotten all the way to your brain to get processed there, there are ganglia, that, which are small clusters of nerves that start being able to do things. Now, now for example, uh, you know, if you've got a really big dinosaur, stegosaurus, I don't know, brontosaurus, whatever, Whatever, whatever are the surviving kinds of dinosaurs and surviving, I don't mean in the sense of extinction at the, at the KT boundary. I mean, when I was a kid, there were all kinds of names of dinosaurs that people said, oh yeah, there's the brontosaurus or there's whatever. And then later on, people said that's paleontology is wrong. You know, there were three different skeletons and they were all connected together and they're really different species, but some museum put them all together and said it was a diplodocus or something. So, so I say these dinosaurs might have gone extinct in the nomenclature of paleontology, if not, you know, they've been extinct for 65 million years or more um, as, as actual creatures. But anyway, if you're a big enough dinosaur the, and you're trying to walk, the speed of nerve impulses, presumably in dinosaurs, is pretty much the same as it is in us humans. And it, you just need to, uh, in fact, I think the same is true in, in, uh, in, in animals today, you need to do something with your back legs, so to speak, even though the impulse, the nerve impulse from your brain doesn't have time to get there um, in the time that you know you need to, to make that walk. You know, I, I know it's the case, in fact, that even, even animals where you, you know, disconnect the brain, you can still get walking motion to happen. So there are these ganglia and so on these, that are sort of in the, in the mini brains that are causing certain things to happen to peripheral objects like legs and so on, even independent of sort of the control of the of central brain. So I, I suspect in things like octopuses, octopodes, or whatever they, you want to call them, uh, that the, the, I think the official plural of octopus is, is octopodes, because I think it's a Greek word and, and that would be how it would pluralize, at least in ancient Greek. Um, but in any case, the, the um, uh, this question of, of sort of having these separate sort of ganglia controlling each, each tentacle um, is, uh, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's something that is, now you, you then could ask, does that ganglion have a view of the world? You know, just like we think in our brains, we have kind of a, a representation of the world and the mind that's in our brains, does the ganglion of tentacle seven of the octopus have a view of the world based on what's happened to the octopus tentacle? Probably yes. You know, in terms of different views of the world, uh, for example, in let's say insects or trilobites for that matter, they have compound eyes. So just as we are forming not one, but two images for our two different eyes of the world, they have little omatidia and they might form a hundred low resolution images of the world. And so that actually they're not, they're not imaging in the same way that we are with the lens of the eye and so on. They're just sensing light levels in different directions. Um, and so then you could ask, well, can you synthesize a view of the world from that? So for example, there's the question, you know, if you've got a moving object and for us, it's like in our eye is connected to you know, the, the, the on the retina, there's an array of cells, maybe uh, on the order of what, uh, it's about 10 million cells, I guess, um, that are the, the light sensitive cells on our retina. And then those, from those cells, there's a bundle of nerves goes through the optic nerve. So at every position on the retina, 
there'll be different nerves in the optic nerve that are taking the, the light signal from that part of our retina and putting it into a particular part of our primary visual cortex in the back of our head. Um, the, uh, yes, it's a design bug, presumably, that our primary visual cortex is at the back of our head when our eyes are at the front of our head. I don't know exactly how that happened evolutionarily. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, it, usually what happens in biology is it starts off well, you can kind of make it work that way. And then biology finds a way to kind of pile on other perhaps even useful functionality as a, as a result of the kind of arbitrary decision that was made. So perhaps there's useful functionality that's been piled onto that, that fact. But anyway, the point is that, that we've got individual nerve cells that are looking at different parts, that are connected to different parts of our retina. Whereas in the case of a compound eye, you've actually got different light sensitive pieces that different sort of mini eyes that are all having to be synthesized together. So now the question would be for the octopus was it with its separate tentacle, you know, mini brains, um, does it have a coherent view of space, for example? Uh, you know, or, or is it the case that it's, you know, that the fact that its separate tentacles are separately operated in some sense causes it to not synthesize an overall view of space? Hard to know. It'd be fascinating to have the discussion with an octopus if we could do the translation. The, um, I think, uh, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, this question of, of what um, uh, I was going to say, I mean, in some sense, our species has, you know, 7 billion, whatever it is, 8 billion brains in our species. And one could ask, so how does that cause us as a species to see the world? And it's complicated because we have, you know, within our brains, there are different parts of our brains that are connected by sort of high bandwidth connections of, of, um, uh, of nerve cells and so on. Between all of us different humans, the, the communication bandwidth is considerably lower because it's just things like us talking to each other or reading what gets written or seeing a picture or, or something. It's much lower bandwidth. But yet somehow in some first approximation, and the level of approximation is is the cause of much geopolitics, um, you know, we have a coherent view of the world. Now, of course, in reality, uh, you know, not everybody has the same kind of view of the world and, and what's important in the world and so on, and what things are relevant to pay attention to in the world and so on. And uh, somebody uh, might say, you know, that's a, that's a magnificent uh, treescape or something. And somebody else might say, I don't really notice that. All I notice is the road that's going through it or, or whatever else it is. Um, so, you know, th this, this question of, you know, does, does one maintain coherence for the whole species? And that's, that's sort of something where, um, you know, I, I guess it's an interesting question whether if you're a species that has, you know, a substantial mini brain, could your mini brain just disagree with your main brain? Um, and I think the answer to that is probably yes in the sense that there will be essentially reflexes that the mini brain wants to, wants to execute, that the main brain says, no, no, that's a really bad idea. There might be something where, you know, you, you, would, you would want to put that foot or whatever, or that tentacle in that place, but the main brain, which has a broader view of reality, uh, will, will say to the, want to say to that tentacle, no, don't do that. Now, I think what typically happens in nervous systems is there's an initial kind of, oh, you're going to do that. And then then maybe the, you know, in in you know half a half a second later or something, when the signal, if you're a very big animal, when the signal gets there from your main brain, maybe it overrides that. I'm not sure. And one could take an analogy to that of what uh, some things that happen in sort of human to human communication are much, much slower time scales. Um yeah, Brian comments, every animal has different capabilities with their own advantages and disadvantages. Dolphins are fast, but they're not fast on land, for sure. Um, uh, Kira uh, is asking, uh, would you agree that humans are the most flexible and adaptable species on Earth? Interesting question. I don't know. That would be my assumption. Humans have one really critical idea or achievement 
that we don't think any other species has, which is the ability to communicate abstract thoughts from one individual to another. There are other species that communicate, you know, bees have little dances that sort of communicate things about which way the honey is. And, you know, there are other kinds of sort of uh, uh, communication mechanisms, but humans seem to be able to have the only species that through the medium of language has this ability to communicate complex abstract thoughts, abstract representations of the world, independent of the world itself and so on. That, that seems to be the unique sort of uh, um, you know, secret source of us humans is that ability to, to, to communicate those things, which means that we get to build up a, 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 over the course of generations and so on, or even uh, in, in an individual lifetime through sort of being able to capture what one's thinking in, in tangible form and so on, we're able to build up these huge towers of capabilities in a way that we don't see any other animals doing. We don't see um, a uh, we don't see this kind of multi generational building up of things like the technology stack that we humans have or the knowledge stack that we humans have. Um, uh, I'm sure there are minor examples in, in primates, for instance, of where there's some ability to build up over generations, but it's nothing compared to what we humans have. And it seems that language, the richness of, of human language, is what allows us to do that. I would argue that if we look at the sort of arc of evolution, uh, well, you know, one thing to say is the first thing one needs that's sort of a key thing to make biology work at all is DNA and the ability to do genomic, sort of to carry knowledge genomically from one generation to the next. Um, and then the very idea that within a single lifetime of, a, of an organism that it can learn things, but then the multi-generational learning that we humans have done is, is something, as I say, quite unique. Uh, through the medium of human language. I would like to claim that computational language that happens to be the thing that I've spent a large part of my life developing, the ability to, to represent things in a kind of uh, systematic computational way that's understandable both to humans and to computers, that that is at some level another stage in this progression that goes from sort of the genomic story of you remember things just because of your genome from from generation to generation to your your sort of learning things uh, memory and within a single generation to this idea of human language but the issue with human language is to reabsorb human language in the next generation you've got to go to school for 12 years or whatever it is you've got it's a very slow process to kind of uh, internalize the um, the meaning of something which was sort of learnt by a previous generation. The thing that's really interesting in computational language is this thing that you can kind of automate that process of absorption. You don't require sort of just going through the cycles of the human brain to do that. You can, you can take an idea and you can sort of have it be something that can be tangibly built on. I mean, as a practical matter, you know, when you, if you're doing science or something and you you have some paper that somebody wrote. It's got all these cool statements and formulas and things in it. If you want to use that paper, normally what you've got to do is go absorb that in your brain, think how to do it, implement it again for yourself and so on. Whereas if it's a computational paper using computational language, you just, I mean, the things I write, you just click any on any picture and that gives you the code that you can copy and you just start running that code that computational language code, and then you can build on it. And I, and I think that this, this ability to do computational language is kind of a, another accelerator for kind of abilities that one has that is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of add-on to the ability that we humans have had for hundreds of thousands of years of dealing with things with, with human language, um, but uh, human natural language. But I think it's an important accelerator and it's one where the consequences of that acceleration are far from what we know yet. I mean, in, in other words, we don't have, we have in many countries pretty universal literacy in, in, in human language. We don't have at all universal literacy in computational language. We have attempts to teach low-level programming languages, which is a different thing. And we have 
you know, the few million people who know Wolfram language, for example, um, is a is a good start. Um, and uh, it um, uh, that's a place where you get to actually express things about the world computationally. When that becomes more universal, and it will, although it may take a while, when that becomes more universal, things will happen as they happened when literacy in, in natural language became universal, maybe 500 years ago in, in many countries and so on. And that allowed all kinds of forms of government and, and knowledge transfer and all sorts of things, allowed all kinds of things, enabled all kinds of things to happen that had not really been possible before. I mean, originally when literacy came in, that enabled you know, the, the systematic organization of cities and things like that, that was back in Babylonian times and so on, maybe 4,000 years ago or something. Um, and that's one thing, when, when some people can do it, that enables some things. When everybody or in a particular area can do it, that enables all kinds of other things. And we're sort of, we're, we're, we're in still, it's only the, the, um, the druids, the high priests or whatever, who can do computational language well. We like to, it's an increasing collection of people, but it's still a subset of the population. And one can't sort of take, take computational language for granted as one can take uh, writing for granted in, in uh, or reading, at least these days. I don't know whether anybody knows how to handwrite anymore. That may be a lost art at some point soon. Um, but uh, uh, you know, take that for granted. The, um, uh, okay, all sorts of comments here. Um, Kruitz is commenting, other species communication is domain specific and ours is universal. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I, I, you know, it's a it's a mystery. What you know, if 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 cockatoos, if we could understand cockatoo chirp language, um, how universal would it be? If we say, I mean, if we think about a computer, for example, at the lowest level, a computer is very domain specific. It says it has instructions, some number of instructions that say, take these two registers and add their values together take this thing and take it from this place in memory and copy it to another place in memory. It's pretty specific, low-level stuff. Yet, the amazing thing about computation is you can build up from that low-level stuff, and even from even lower-level stuff, even from these incredibly simple computational systems, you can build up all the richness that we know computation makes possible. And in our physics project, it's pretty clear that it makes possible everything in the universe. It's all sort of computation at the bottom. And so in a sense, what the whole story of computation is, you can build up from these primitives, you can build up a lot of stuff. Now, you know, humans, no doubt in their early hunter-gatherer days were sort of domain specific. They were like, well, I can pick these berries, I can go and chase the mammoth, I can do whatever it is. And the fact that we built up this sort of rich, seemingly universal, ability to talk about things is a consequence of these layers of, of kind of structure that have been built into our language. Now, are we in fact able to talk about anything? No, we're not. You just go look at, uh, in, in our kind of models that have emerged from our physics project and so on, this concept of the Rouliad is this concept of the, the thing that represents sort of the entangled limit of all possible computations you can imagine doing. We think that our experience of the universe is simply us as entities within the Rouliad experiencing the Rouliad, and that gives us kind of our view of physics. And so the question is, if you plop yourself down, and in a sense, we are seeing the Rouliad from a particular vantage point, from a particular point in Rouliad space, just as we see the universe from a particular point in physical space, we're seeing the universe from a particular point in Rouliad space with a particular kind of description language. We can translate to another description language. We know that's possible because of universal computation, because you can program one computer to do anything and anything any other computer can do. But this question of, is it readily understandable to us if we plop ourselves down with a completely different description of the universe? That's kind of similar to the question about octopodes and their multiple brains, or, you know, its view of the universe versus our view of the universe. But we can very easily confront ourselves with a view of the universe that's very alien. I mean, in, in a thing that I've done a lot of is what I call ruleology, the study of simple rules and what they do. There are simple rules where we 
sort of intrinsically understand what they do. We kind of have a, a way of talking about them. We can turn what those rules do into a narrative that we humans can understand. Or we can just pick a rule at random and see what it does. And many rules say, well, that looks interesting. Maybe it's a good piece of art. Maybe it's a good whatever. It, it's something where we don't have that same kind of immediate narrative understanding of what's going on that we do with things which are close to our current point in real space. So in some sense, we humans are still domain specific. We live at a particular place in real space. We have particular description languages for things. And we can plainly see out there in you know, distant in real space, we can jump to those places in real space. We will find it very confusing because we don't have a good kind of narrative uh, way of connecting that to things that we understand. So I, I claim we humans are still pretty domain specific. And I, I think the distinction between us as not domain specific versus your average cockatoo is not obvious to me. What and you know, cockatoos have had the disadvantage that they don't have technology, they've never been able, they don't have a written language, they don't have, we don't even know what their what their spoken language is like. Um, and uh, you know, what could they build if they'd had the same uh, sort of uh, ability to create concrete things? That we do, I don't think we know, and I don't think it's obvious that uh, that I mean, as I say, the fact that we humans can talk about lots of kinds of things in the world, I'm sure that wasn't true 200,000 years ago. In the you know, if if we went back and had a conversation with your average hunter gatherer of 200,000 years ago, I think the the universe of discourse that we would have had would have been quite limited. I mean, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting thought experiment to say, you know, you're going back and you're chatting with somebody from 200,000 years ago. What are you going to talk about? You know, you can talk about, um, I don't know, it's kind of challenging. You can't, um, um, uh, you could ask questions that are sort of features of, of human characteristics. You know, uh, I don't know, you can ask sort of uh, uh, things about what you do, but it, it's, it's it's going to be very difficult, you know. If you if you start saying, um, you know, do you find those kinds of berries tasty? That's that's complicated. Um, you know, the <coughs> you probably can deal with. Do you eat those kinds of berries and not those kinds of berries? Yeah, you can deal with that. I mean, again, these are challenges that you have even today within different groups of people who have different kinds of interests and and sort of cultural backgrounds and so on. Um, let's see, WWW is commenting that the mapping between the world and brain zones is, is a simple geometrical mapping. Is this true for a, a brain leg mapping? Yeah. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. If you look at the, and I don't know, this is probably known. If you look at a dog, for example, that has very smell-based perception of the world, has big olfaction system in its brain. We don't have a big one, but it uses that much more. If you look at the layout of the olfaction system in a dog, what is it like? Because for us, the sensory systems that we have the ones that are for touch, for example, you can go find the places in the brain where you're essentially mapping the, the physical geometrical structure of your surface, you know, that your fingers, your, your feet, whatever else, are mapped to particular parts of the brain geometrically. Similarly, with your eyes, the, the position in the retinal image is mapped to a particular place in the brain. With your ears, in our ears, it's the frequency of the sound that is mapped to a particular position in the cochlea and then into the auditory cortex, I think, is mapped in the same way. So a good question would be, which we don't, you know, we don't have a good smell space, so to speak. We don't know which smell is close to which other smell. We know, you know, in visual scene, we can say, well, that object is close to that object visually for us. We could say that sound is at a close frequency to that other sound. But in, in olfaction space, I don't think we have any clear mapping. And so one thing we could do is look for a dog, for example, at what smells uh, sort of connect to what nearby regions in the brain. 
maybe that experiment has been done. I don't know. Um, but that would give us sort of an interesting way. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, the, yeah, at least as of a few years ago, there was a lot of complexity in that. So uh, companies that make perfume, for example, have a uh, great interest, obviously, in making things that smell a certain way. And it's still somewhat unclear what all the dynamics of how a molecule, you know, you've got this molecule, it's a certain shape. What is it going to smell like? You know, is that going to smell like a, uh, you know, a lily or something, or is that going to smell like whatever? Um, you know, based on the shape of the molecule, what is it going to smell like? That's been a hard question to answer. I, I'm not sure what the most recent work on that is, but but back in not too long ago, it was still not clear whether it was the sort of the shape, the vibration characteristics of the molecule, or all those kinds of things that that would affect it. But then the question is, if you've got all these molecules, there are all these different shapes. How do they lay out in smell space, so to speak? And you know, does one get uh, when one looks at the dog's olfaction system, you know, do we, is it natural? You know, to a dog, it will be natural. Oh, that smell is like that other smell. Just like to us, we will be saying, look, can't you see that that thing is really close to that other thing in physical space? And so I think this idea that, um, you know, there is closeness surely in smell space, at least for a dog. If not, you know, not for us right now. That's a different kind of sensory system. Um, let's see. Um, I have any more about this type of topic, and then we can talk about other things. Um, all right. Uh, Oh, there's a question from Brady. Do you think it's possible we might live inside a cosmic superorganism analogous to the way microbes live, in, microbes live inside of us? Well, yeah, we do. I mean, that's sort of the whole ecosystem of the world and all the different organisms and you know, members of a single species and so on. That's not that different from microbes. You know, we know like the, the, the microbiome and, and that we have, for example, all the microbes that live in our gut, they have a whole ecosystem in there. You know, in that ecosystem, if you start eating different kinds of things, you'll put different sort of stresses on that ecosystem. And gradually, just like if there's an ice age or something and the critters with longer fur do better, well, same if you start eating only fruit or something, uh, the microbes in your gut that like that will start to do better and so on. Or, you know, if you take an antibiotic and you blow up a bunch of microbes, you'll have um, the, uh, um, you'll have other ones that will sort of come in that are more adapted to that. So yeah, it's a, it's a continual thing that, you know, we have an ecosystem inside us of our microbes. And uh, you know, in the last several years, there's increasing knowledge of that of that microbiome ecosystem and the application of sort of ecological ideas to that. And I think it's uh, it's an interesting question whether it's becoming clear that the, the microbiome is, is pretty important to human health and that there's a lot of sort of feedback mechanisms from what's happening in the microbiome to what happens elsewhere in the body and so on. And so it's like, you know, uh, conserve your microbiome, so to speak. Um, and as an interesting question, what one can learn and what the interplay is between that and sort of ecosystems and the earth in general, and you know what's important, what's not, uh, you know, in in um, uh, and and how that in the case of the microbes, it's a sort of interdependence on the scale of the stuff that's inside, you know, one person's gut or something, um, and uh, it's interesting to see how that how that interdependence works. I don't think the um, uh, I don't think there's much in the way of, um, I think it's kind of a, a many different, there's a great diversity of different kinds of bacteria, more diverse. I mean, they don't really have quite the same sort of species characteristics that um, uh, with distinct species that, um, that happen in, in a higher, more complicated organisms. Um, so, you know, so it's an even more complicated story as a result of that. But yeah, I, I think, I think the, we are a super organism for those for those microbes, and we 
as individual members of the ecosystem of the earth are um, a kind of you know operating within that i think i think it's um uh yeah th th lots of lots of things to say about that all right let's see um huh. um oh boy so many interesting questions here uh Okay, all right, one more on brains and then we'll go to something else for a few minutes. Uh, Spare asks, is there a way to tell how much of our intelligence emerges from high level brain functions versus low level kind of cellular computation? You know, an interesting question. When you're thinking about something, how much of your brain is actually being used? If you were a computer, a very small fraction of the computer is being used for many kinds of operations. Um, in, you know, most of the memory of the computer is not being touched at any given time. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're streaming video or something and there's lots of pieces of the computer. Usually what happens, I think, with computers and probably with biological organisms is once there's a thing, you're always doing it. There'll be a special purpose piece of hardware that's made to just do that. So for example, if you're always breathing, let's say, or your heart is always beating, there's going to be some fairly special purpose thing that's just going to take care of that. And it's the things where there's sort of general purpose stuff that are the part of our brain that we sort of typically think most about. And that's where sort of our, our general thinking happens. But I think it's a good question whether when you're trying to, I don't know, figure out some science question, write a piece of code, do whatever, you know, how much of your brain is actually active. And, and we know a certain amount about this from functional MRI imaging and from looking at sort of which parts of the brain are, are taking power, so to speak, which parts of the brain are consuming uh, glucose and so on um, and are active. I don't know how accurately that really tells us how much is going on and how much that just tells us this area is more active than that area. But you know, the surprising thing about brains uh, is that they managed to knit together the sort of single thread of experience that we believe we have. In other words, I might have 100 billion neurons and they might each be doing what they're doing, but somehow I think I'm having a definite thread of coherent experience. And that process, that sort of attention thing that makes us have this coherent thread of experience, that's kind of knitting together the activities of some fraction of those 100 billion neurons. How many are active in a given thought? I don't think we have any real idea. And I think that, that the process by which we go from all those individual neurons to a coherent thought is a very interesting process that is really a, a, a part of the whole story of being an observer, doing a measurement. You know, When we say we're measuring the, the pressure of this gas, well, by having some piston somewhere or something, what we're really saying is there are all these gas molecules and they're all hitting in all kinds of random places, but we're taking all those separate impacts and we're turning that into the overall motion of this piston. And so similarly in our brains, we're taking all of the activity of all those billions of neurons and we're turning that into, oh, I just thought about the color green or something, a, a coherent thought. So a question you might ask is, our neurons are being sort of correlated to have that coherent thought, if we look at kind of all the, the creatures of the earth or the people of the earth, to what extent is the same thing happening or not? And again, you know, that's a complicated issue because there isn't, you know, at the level of an individual hu human, we think, oh, we're thinking definite thoughts. We have definite goals. We're doing definite things. When you say at the level of a country or at the level of the world, how does that work? Well, you can say a certain amount about that. I don't think it's as coherent as one could say it is for an individual human, but it's sort of the same kind of process, I think, of formation. We don't know really how it works in humans. You know, how do you make a decision, go left rather than right? You could be polling a billion neurons and saying, hey, what do you all think? And kind of voting, and eventually the neurons say, hey, go, you know, more of us say go left, so go left. Whether you know, the brain sort of is a, is a giant democracy like that, I don't think we really know. Um, I think that um, uh, the sort of question of, of how, how one concentrates 
sort of what you might refer to as sort of the, the cellular level computation, how one concentrates that into coherent thoughts is a key problem of neuroscience. And you know, even describing that process, even describing what does it mean to concentrate that, to knit together all of those individual neurons and make it a coherent thought, that's uh, uh, that, that's a sort of defining what that means and, and understanding that is, is really, it's an interesting thing. Now, now, obviously we know a certain amount from artificial neural nets. We know, oh, there's this array of pixels and they all do their different things. And the artificial neural net, probably much like the human neural net, forms the thought that it's a picture of a cat. And so it's going from all those individual, in, all those individual sort of uh, pixels to this, oh, and it's, it's a picture of a cat. So that's, that's the, but, but how to think about this process in general of the forming of thoughts and the cohering of all those individual neural activities it's that's that's something I don't think we understand uh, at all well, and it's sort of a, a key problem there. And you know, when we have I don't know a dream or something, you know, it's probably there's probably a certain amount of random activity going on in our brains at the level of individual neurons firing and not firing, and you know, getting cleaned out of of the gunk that's built up during the day or whatever else it is. And and those sort of random firings, we have such a strong sort of capability to cohere things together, that even if it started as random firings, we say, well, actually a definite thing happened. We have a thought about how that worked and so on. Let's see. All right, just a few more. We're having, I'm having fun here at least. Um, the, uh, oh, William asks, what's the simplest possible object? Okay, I have a very simple answer to that. It's a single atom of existence, a single what we call EAM, e -M -E. Uh, In our model of physics, space is made of all these atoms of space that are related to each other, connected in a giant network. And that's sort of the, the lowest level representation of space is as this collection of relations between atoms of space. Uh, we think in this Rouliad object, it's doing all these computations, but what is the data structure on which these computations are acting? It is this thing that is made of atoms of existence. And what, what is an atom of existence? Well, it has really just, the only thing to say about it is it exists and it is, or we can say it exists uh, and it is unique. Every atom of existence is different from every other atom of existence. And atoms of existence can be related in certain, in, you know, there are relations between them, but they are distinct. They, are, they have their own independent thing. If you were into sort of computer stuff, they would have a UUID, a universal unique identifier, for example. Every atom of space would have one of these. Knowing that two atoms of space are distinct is something that you can't know uh, this is a complicated issue. You as an observer within the universe can't know that. You have to kind of go outside the universe to be able to prove that for sure. It's kind of like you can't prove the consistency of an axiomatic system from within that system itself. The, uh, um, let's see, okay, maybe one or two more here. Uh, Um, well, as a, since we're on a brain's kick today, um, Brady comments, can you explain why the default scientific position is that consciousness does not rely on quantum mechanics? They say, to me, it seems obvious that at least that it would at least to some extent. Well, quantum mechanics is kind of the, the theory that describes how very small things work. And in our model of physics, we have a pretty clear view of what, how quantum mechanics works. In the world of classical physics, ordinary physics, sort of definite things happen. You 
you uh, sort of you drop something, it falls in a definite trajectory. It uh, in quantum mechanics, there's this whole uh, whole sort of tree of possible trajectories, and we as observers, uh, we only get to be sensitive to sort of the probabilities of all those different paths. There are many paths that are intrinsically taken, but we only get to sort of sense some probabilities across all those different paths. Well, so kind of what happens is we, and this is, gets a little bit complicated in, in our physics project, um, just as we're pretty big compared to, for example, ordinary atoms and molecules. So we don't sense a typical, you know, we don't, when we, we, when we pour some water, we don't say, oh, look at all those molecules coming out. It's just like a continuous fluid that just comes out, uh, we can describe in that sort of continuum way. And that's because we're, we're really big compared to those molecules. And so we kind of aggregate together those individual molecules. Well, in what we call branchial space, the space of quantum branches, all these different sort of paths of history that can happen in quantum mechanics, we're also pretty big in branchial space. And so we, you know, I, I should say this word branchial, I, I, the British version and the American, I can't imitate the American version, B-R-A-N-C-H-I-A-L, branchial, whatever. I just, uh, I want to clarify it's it's uh, what it is. So, so it isn't sort of... Um, uh, mangled by my by my slightly British accent. Um, the uh, in any case, we're pretty big in branchial space as well, and so we are, in a sense, aggregating across all these different branches of history. So we say most of the time we just say, "Oh, you know, this average kind of thing happens," just like we'd say most of the time we'd say this average kind of thing happens with molecules in the water. Now, there are special things we can do that kind of drill down, just like there are special things we can do to notice the water is made of molecules. There are special things we can do to notice that it isn't really the single thread that happens in, in physics. It's all these different threads in different places in branchial space. So there is always quantum mechanics underneath. It's just we aggregate things together so it doesn't matter much. So now the question is, in our brains, is our brain... Is there a description of our brain that says, let's just aggregate everything to go to classical physics? Or does it matter? Is our brain sensitive to those multiple branches at some fundamental level? We don't know for sure. I think that the kind of the activities of artificial neural nets and the things we've learned from machine learning and so on make it all the more likely that it really doesn't matter that there is sort of quantum mechanics underneath. In other words, that the the sort of the the functional aspects of brains depend only on sort of very aggregated properties of things like neurons. It doesn't matter that the neuron has lots of um, microtubules on its surface and that that are doing all kinds of things and have all kinds of, of complicated patterns. All that matters is that neuron fired. It generated an electrical signal that was passed to a neighboring neuron. That's all that matters about a neuron. It's the same thing in a computer. For example, we could say, do we care about the precise voltage current characteristics of the transistors? Probably not. All we really care is that they switch on or off. And they make you know, a binary digital computer, for example. So it, it's a question of what matters, what doesn't. What matters to the kind of large level of the thoughts we have and what is, yes, it's there inside the physics, but it doesn't really matter at the level of description that we're interested in about what thoughts we have and so on. So the question of whether, oh, for example, let me, let me give an example. Let's say we try and make up a random number. We're gonna pick a number at random. Well, let's say we're a, we're a critter that is flying around and it wants to fly around a random path. Because if it flew around in a very regular path, its predators would long ago have, have, have uh, eaten all of it. Because you know, if, if if what happened was that the the fly that's flying around always just went in a you know in a in a backwards forwards backwards forwards path, or or whatever, or the or the creature that was foraging a particular area of a you know eating a leaf or foraging in some area of of, uh, of land, 
that if it always went in this precise spiral, you know, it's kind of like the robot vacuum cleaner or something that goes in the precise spiral as it goes and explores the room. If if you were a predator of robot vacuum cleaners, um, the, the robot vacuum cleaners wouldn't last long because you'd always know it's going to go in a spiral. I know where it's going to go next. I can lie in wait and pounce and uh, eat the robot vacuum cleaner or whatever, or um, drain its batteries or whatever I want to do. But in um, so there's a value to having to being random to doing random things. That's a that's valuable in certain situations to certain species and so on. And so now the question is, where does that randomness come from? You know, when the fly is flying around seemingly randomly to us, uh, you know, how do you get the randomness? Does it, in fact, reach down to some quantum level thing that's uh, from which it's extracting the randomness? Probably not, because it's very easy to make randomness, as I've learned in, in my activities of, of looking at simple programs and what they do. It's actually very easy to make apparent randomness just from things that can be done at the level of simple computations and so on. But that's a place where you might like to think that, oh, is there some sort of quantum going on? And, and there are effects, like, for example, the uh, magnetic sensing of, uh, that exists in pigeons, maybe it even exists in us, we don't know for sure, where you can directly sense in your brain the magnetic field of the Earth and know sort of which way is north. Um, that The way that happens is almost certainly a quantum mechanical effect that involves uh, a sort of a, a, a electron spins and uh, trapped in certain ways and so on, and able to be amplified by by the brain. So you know, th so there are quantum kinds of things. Now, does does quantum mechanics matter when I have a thought? Does it really matter that things are underlying quantum? Actually, the thing that most indicates it doesn't really matter is that we have definite thoughts that we've managed to aggregate things together to the point where instead of it being the raw quantum mechanical, many, many parts of history, many different things going on, we say, I say a definite things. I'm, I'm talking to you. I've got a definite stream of words that are being generated by my brain. And that's something where it is not the case. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the, um, it's not the case that, that you're hearing from all the different parts of my brain all the different kind of the the giant uh, cacophonous, you know, um, uh, non symphony or something of uh, of all the different. Oh, you know, the frontal lobe is telling you this. The uh, the you know this part of the hippocampus is telling you this. And um, you know, instead, no, we humans sort of aggregate things into the single thread. And I think for the purpose of that single thread, my guess is the quantum effects are not important. Um, uh, there may be some specific areas, just like in, in typical experience of the world, quantum effects aren't important, but there are particular things you can find by looking, and that's how quantum mechanics was discovered. There are particular detailed things you can find, you can amplify, whatever, if you have the right kind of equipment and instruments and make the right kind of measurements to know that there really are quantum things going on. Let's see. Well, William asks, why is it that we as observers never see quantum superpositions? Why are superpositions aligned to our macroscopic observations? Well, these different threads of history, they can correspond to different things happening in the world. And if you slice history at a particular moment, you have all these threads. And these, that, that, that thing, that slice at a particular moment, is a superposition of the different things that are happening in all those threads of history. But what we do, I think, as observers of that, is we just say, we're going to conflate all those things together. We're going to assume they're all the same. We're going to treat them as the same. And it's a little bit subtle because our brains are branching just the same way the universe is branching. So saying we're going to treat them as the same, it's like the, the two octopus brains on its different tentacles or something are just going to conclude that their view of the world is the same. Actually, I suppose the... Um, uh, um, reminds me of a, a person. Oh, I don't know if this is a tellable story, but but um, uh, a um, a person I knew who was a, um, a kind of a, a very interesting sort of thinker about foundations of physics, in particular quantum mechanics. And um, I remember uh, having dinner with him once, and um, I was talking about. Uh, 
you know, the photon. It said, you can only understand the photon if you come from a particular cultural background. You know, you're out of luck. If you're from a different, you know, cultural, religious tradition, whatever, you won't understand the photon. And it's um, uh, the, um, uh, I think the thing that, um, um, uh, this, there's this question of, could we, so our brains are branching, merging, etc. It turns out the big fact about quantum mechanics is that conflating these branches of history is not inconsistent. In other words, things, it works out to just assume these branches of history are the same for purposes of what, uh, what we are perceiving in the universe. So in other words, we can successfully say there's a single branch of history. Now, you know, it's an interesting question. If you're a giant creature that's, you know, huge spread out creature across the universe, you're a light year across. And by the way, a black hole, a few black holes form inside you. And there are event horizons which, which restrict the information flow uh, between different parts of you. Then the question would be, what, you know, you will no longer be able to form a coherent view of your world because there are parts of your brain effectively that are separated off by event horizons. Um, and so I, I think this question of whether, you know, when can you form a coherent view of the world? When is it consistent to form a coherent view of the world? Probably won't be if there are a bunch of black holes in your brain, so to speak. But the, the fact is the non-trivial fact, it's related to this thing we call causal invariance in our physics theory of physics, um, is, uh, leads to this fact that you, it is okay, it is consistent to make certain kinds of conflations. And so I think what one could imagine is, could there be a brain where one intrinsically experiences quantum mechanics, where these different branches of history have not been conflated? And where sort of one part of your brain is thinking one thing is happening, one part of your brain is thinking another thing is happening, or more locally, in uh, uh, you know, really it's these different branches of history, not oh, it's a different place in space where one thing has happened versus another. But let's say you could spatialize it, which is sort of what's happening when you do an interference experiment or something like that. You're spatializing what is essentially different branches of history, and saying that that that, that that's some, um, and so. Let's imagine you could do that. Maybe you could imagine some people, whatever, who've managed to sort of train themselves, if it's possible, to kind of think multiple thoughts at a time by using sort of these quantum branches. Now, it's sort of an interesting thing because when we talk about quantum computers and things, we imagine in the brain of the quantum computer, it really is following all these paths. The problem with quantum computers and so on is that they're interfacing to us humans, and we humans want a definite answer. We want a definite thing to have happened. So the question then comes up, could you have something where our fundamental human experience is quantum? And that, I suppose, is raised by the possibility of having sort of quantum mechanics as important in the brain. Could we have a quantum experience of the world? Our normal experience of the world is this coherent one where this thing happens, and this thing happens, and that thing happens, rather than this experience where there are many paths of history and they're all sort of simultaneously occurring. That would be the sort of quantum experience of the brain. Now, it could be the case that if you really want a quantum computer to work, you have to have a quantum observer. So it's like you have to be sort of, you have to be in this strange kind of state where you're, you're thinking multiple things. I don't even know how to describe it. It's a, it's a different, um, it's, a, it's an experience that we don't normally have. I mean, I think you know, people say that uh, people with various kinds of um, uh, psychological, psychiatric kinds of issues can sort of have multiple personalities, multiple things going on. I, I don't think those happen uh, simultaneously. I don't think it's like one part of the brain is acting like this person, one part of the brain is acting like that person at the same time. I don't think that's how it works, but, but maybe it is. Um, and, you know, then, then there's the question of sort of, okay, but, you know, as humans, we have, for example, a, a single stream of, of yakking with talking. We don't have, as I was mentioning before, it's not like 
oh, we've got part of a word comes from this part of a brain and then another part of a word comes from another part of the brain and you're having 17 conversations at the same time all being communicated on this channel that is human language because human language doesn't work that way. Human language has is this single threaded thing where we say this, then this, then this. It's kind of like, you know, when we look at communication between computers, uh, typically computers will, they'll send a packet. That's, oh, there's a bunch of video information that's here. Oh, the next thing is a piece of email. Oh, the next thing is this. They don't sort of scramble those things. Now, maybe at the very low level for various kinds of transmission reasons, there is some scrambling that can happen in certain cases, but mostly it's this thing about there's a sequence of things that get sent. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, so in the end, uh, sort of it's an interesting thing to speculate on <coughs> whether there's a, a form of human experience that is sort of a fundamentally quantum human form of human experience that uh, at least the most of us don't have. And so, and, and if we were to describe it in language, what does it feel like to have that experience? I, I don't know. That's a very challenging thing to describe. Um, let's see. So William is commenting, could it be then that quantum mechanics just involves higher dimensions of time? The fact that quantum mechanics is comprehensible to us is then because we're trying to understand higher dimensional time from a single dimensional thread of experience. Well, dimensions is like, it's like if you're laying out a graph, a network, and your network is, is a giant grid, let's say a two-dimensional grid. And you say, well, it's, a, it's like a two-dimensional thing, three dimensions, you know, it's a, it's a giant uh, a cubicle thing, for example. That's, those are dimensions. But what happens in, uh, and, and you could then talk about, you know, if, if time had these, um, instead of going in a single thread as we usually experience it, had, was in some grid, that would be sort of a two-dimensional time. But what we actually think is that time is this kind of graph. It's not one dimensional, it's not two dimensional, it's a graph of possibilities. And what we're doing is we're compressing that graph down to a single thread. Um, and yes, that's a, that's a thing that we're doing that approximates that full graph, which is the full story of quantum mechanics to that single thread. And we are understanding it by making that conflation, just like we're understanding, I don't know, the, the flow of water by just talking about the continuous flow of water rather than saying, and this is where all the, the trillions and trillions of molecules go. Let's see. Um, <coughs> oh my. I thought I'd finally sort of gotten rid of this cough. I think it may have been, um, uh, uh, it, it, um, I, I've noticed I've been working on a history project and uh, I have a lot of antiquarian books and I also happen to be allergic to mold. And so history project has a serious occupational hazard of uh, the fact you're getting out all these all these old books. And um, uh, in fact, just yesterday I was, I have a storage place where I keep a lot of, of, of uh, older material and I was there. And it was one of the, um, I'm not a big one for wearing masks to avoid viruses, but this was a case where wearing a mask to avoid the mold worked out pretty well. Um, well, let's see, I think we should probably wrap up here because I've got to go something with my day job, but let me just see if there's any quick questions here that I might be able to address. Aaron asks, why do my glasses get foggy, but my eyeballs do not? Okay, my theory is that's a simple question to answer. Um, I think the uh, you know the surface of your eye is continuously covered by a film of, I mean, there's a, there's a film of liquid, I think, that's generated by, you know, the tear ducts and so on. And I, I think the reason that you don't get, uh, hmm. see, this is always what happens. These questions, which I think are really easy, 
turn out to be not quite as easy as I expect. I mean, glasses get foggy because they are cold. If you look at an infrared picture of a person, your skin is hot, your glasses are cold. Um, and when there's, there's water vapor in the air, the, um, uh, at a colder temperature, that will condense into something that is like droplets of water, even though that wouldn't happen. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, maybe you've stumped me there a little bit. I have to, I have to think this one through. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so, so Cybot is commenting, fog, concrete, droplets on a wet surface. Uh, yeah, I mean, clearly, okay, that's a, that's a good point, that, you know, a droplet is a piece of liquid. And once you have liquid, any droplet that forms is just going to be integrated into the liquid. So it's not going to be a separate thing where you've got a solid surface that is like your glasses, and then you've got droplets on the solid surface. Yeah, I think I think that's right. That that's that's right. That's that's probably the, the cleanest thing to say. The reason that things get foggy is because you've got a bunch of essentially fog, which is you know droplets of water on on your glasses, and when light goes through those droplets, the because the droplets are small, the light is scattered in all kinds of different directions. But if that droplet, which is a liquid, came was was on the surface of a liquid, the molecules in that droplet will just all spread out and be part of the liquid. Um, and so that uh, and, and so that means that they won't will no longer have this characteristic that they are tiny little things that scatter light in all these different directions. Um, and uh, Paul is commenting not not to forget that eyelids eyelids act as as windshield wipers. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, yes, yes, no doubt. And, and that's right. If you have a little thing in your eye, it'll it'll tend to get um, uh, sort of moved around by that. All right. Well, I think the, 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 I, the, there's actually a bunch more that I think of to say about this, but maybe uh, maybe for another time. Um, all right. Well, thanks. Uh, um, uh, thanks for lots of interesting questions. And uh, I have to say, as I as I try and explain stuff to you all, uh, I understand things a bunch better. So, and there were quite a number of things today where uh, I think my understanding just improved quite a bit. Uh, like, for example, the the comment about um, uh, the relationship between measurement and observer theory and the coherence of uh, of neurons in the brain. I had not really put those things properly together before. So thanks for stimulating those kinds of thoughts and, um, uh, and perhaps helping to uh, generate more coherence in my thinking than would otherwise exist by virtue of the fact that maybe all those independent thoughts have to get concentrated into a kind of a, a stream of live streaming. Anyway, thanks a lot and uh, see you another time. Bye for now.